Temperature around 80 degrees. The cars, 37, are poised and set to go. Yesterday, we spoke with a gentleman that has operated this track for a number of years, Les Richter. Well, they see Grand National Stock Car Racing in a, in a different form, and it's exciting for the people that have been raised on it, and it's interesting to those people in the South to come out here to see their good old boys and their stars and their favorites run a course where they have to shift up and down, turn right and left, and uh, it makes it exciting uh, when you consider that uh, oval racing is drafting. Here it is a lot of skill of shifting and braking and being able to figure out what you're going to do in the next turn. So uh, Riverside uh, has a lot of my heart in it, and uh, it's uh, going to be a great race today, and we're really delighted that uh, we have these two races here at Riverside. Les Richter, a gentleman that really loves racing dearly. Before he played professional football, he said he used to watch the midgets run up at Fresno, California. He came into this facility in 1960 and has improved it constantly and brought the Winston Cup Grand National cars to the West Coast. As we scan around the track and see this beautiful nine-turn facility, it's a beautiful road course, 2.62 miles in length. Today they'll be running 95 laps 248.9 miles, which calculates out to be 400 kilometers. Standing by in the pit area is the gentleman who will be covering the action down there on the pit lane, Pat Patterson. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and it's a gorgeous afternoon down here in the pit area, a blur of color, a real spectacle for everyone to see as we're in sunny Southern California getting ready for the start of this Budweiser 400 race. Today on the starting grid, you have all your cars ready at this time. The drivers are getting into the cars, getting strapped in. The crew chiefs are preparing to make sure the final details of this race are getting ready to run. Darrell Waltrip on the pole here at Riverside. On the outside, Tim Richmond. As we get ready for the start, the final things are being laid down so that we can get this race underway. Hey, we're gonna make a pit stop and we'll be right back with more racing action from Riverside International Raceway right after this. Well, the field is set down below. 37 cars are set to go to tackle this nine-turn road course. Starting on the pole position, in position number one, Darrell Waltrip, the Pepsi Challenger Chevrolet at 116.421 miles per hour. He's won the last six of the eight poles here at Riverside. On the outside, front row, it's car number 27, Tim Richmond. He's out of Mooresville, North Carolina, originally from Ashland, Ohio. He's in a Pontiac of Raymond Beetle, 115.925 miles per hour. Starting third in the Budweiser Chevrolet out of Trinity, North Carolina, is Terry Labonte in car number 44, 115.003 miles per hour. The front three starters all broke the old track record set last year by Waltrip at 114.419 miles per hour. Starting fourth on the field is Ricky Rudd out of Chesapeake, Virginia in the Piedmont Airline Chevrolet at 114.806 miles per hour. Fifth on the grid is car number 88, Jeff Bodine, Pleasant Garden, North Carolina, originally from Chemung, New York, in a Pontiac at 114.753 miles an hour. Sixth on the grid is handsome Harry Gant, protege to Hal Needham and Burt Reynolds in car number 33. He's out of Taylorsville, North Carolina, in the Skull Bandit Buick. Seventh on the grid, Jim Bound, Portland, Oregon, in the Wholesale Truck Parts Buick, 114.135 miles per hour, his qualifying speed in car 96. Eighth is the all-time winner in NASCAR, Richard Petty, Rattleman, North Carolina, the STP Pontiac, number 43, 113.921 miles an hour. Ninth on the grid is car number 98, Joe Rutman, in a Pontiac. Tenth is car 22, Bobby Allison, in a Buick. Eleventh is car 75, Neil left. Bonnet, in a Chevrolet, sponsored by Warner Hodgson from out here in California. Twelfth on the grid is car 71, Dave Marcus, out of Skyland, North Carolina. Thirteenth is Morgan Shepard, in the car that won both races last season here at Riverside, the Stacy Buick. 14th on the grid is Rick McRae, Bloomington, California, in car 08, it's a Pontiac. 15th on the grid is car number 15, Dale Earnhardt, Mooresville, North Carolina, in a Ford. 16th on the grid is 64, Randy Becker, Highlands, California, in a Buick. 17th on the grid is car 73, Bill Schmidt, Redding, California, in a Mountain Dew Chevrolet. 18th on the grid is car 04, Herschel McGriff, Bridalvale, Oregon, the oldest driver in the field at 55 years of age. 
19th is car nine. Bridesmaid, but never a bride, Bill Elliott, always finishing second six times in the last two years. He's out of Dawsonville, Georgia. He's in a Ford. 20th on the grid is Dick Brooks in car 90 out of Albemarle, North Carolina, in a Ford. 21st is car 78, Jim Robinson, North Hollywood, California, in an Oldsmobile. 22nd is car number 51, Scott Miller, Garden Grove, California, in a Pontiac. 23rd is car 7, Kyle Petty, the son of Richard Petty, in a Pontiac. 24th is Don Waterman out of Portland, Oregon, in a Pontiac, car number 38. 25th on the grid is car 13, Stephen Wheeler, Bakersville, California, in a Buick. 26th is 03, Glenn Francis, in a Pontiac, out of Bakersville, California, also. 27th is car number 70, J.D. McDuffie, the tough independent, out of Sanford, North Carolina, in a Pontiac. Sixth on the grid is D.K. Ulrich, Harrisburg, North Carolina, in a Buick. 29th is car 66, Ron Esau, Lakeside, California, in a Buick. Starting 30th, Sterling Marlin, currently leading the points for Rookie of the Year honors in a Pontiac car 17. 31st on the grid is Trevor Boys out of Alberta, Canada, in the James Hilton Chevrolet, car number 48. 32nd on the grid, Ronnie Thomas, Christiansburg, Virginia, in a Pontiac car 41. 33rd is car 52, Jimmy Means, Forest City, North Carolina, in a Chevrolet. 34th on the grid is car number 67, Buddy Arrington, out of Martinsville, Virginia. 35th on the grid is Bob Kennedy, car 94, in the Ehrlich Motors Chevrolet. We'll be back to Riverside, California, in one minute. Flagman is standing by. He's ready. The green waves. They charge down towards turn one. Your early leader is Darrell Waltrip. He was expected to jump out front and take a lead. The second place runner will be Tim Richmond. Going third will be Ricky Rudd. The fourth place runner is Terry Labonte. They come through the S's. Right now they're in third gear coming up through this portion of the course. Coming up to turn six. This is the outside retaining wall. It's Kind of unique, we'll explain it to you a little later. Waltrip dives over to the inside, apexes the corner perfectly. He heads down the short chute now, making his way towards turn eight. He works the outside of the track, covers down very well, apexes the corner beautifully now, moves over to the left-hand side of the track. He's going down the long back straightaway, 3,000 feet before he gets to the dog lake, 4,000 feet for the entire distance. Coming under the bridge, there's a bump right there. All these cars will feel the effects of that. As the suspensions get softer, some of these cars will actually bottom out. They're running single file, coming through the dog leg. Waltrip now stretches out his lead. Waltrip by five car lengths. Now, we see the 27 car. Richmond, trying to make a bid, gets into the corner and breaks late, tries to draw up onto the rear bumper of the number 11 car. The two-time national champion is back to the strike. Darrell Waltrip, car 11. Richmond second, Rudd is third. Labonte runs fourth. Fifth place runner, Jeff Bodine. Seventh, Harry Gant. Eighth on the field is Richard Petty. And he's being challenged by Bobby Allison as they go back through the S's. Coming through the S's, they're running the perfect line here. It's very difficult to pass during this portion of the track. Richmond rolls out to the outside. Richmond made a dive. We have a car on the pit lane. And that's Neil Bonnet. Bonnet obviously has a problems with the inside tires here at the track, which are on the right rather than on the left. He's in the pits now, an early pit stop. Another car in, car number 96, is also into the pit area. The 96 car in early, Sterling Marlin also in. 96 is Jim Bound, who started up front. He was one of the quicker West Coast drivers to qualify in the race. Bonnet is back out of the pits. Bonnet in early. Bonnet scraped the retaining wall somewhere on the course, and with the problems, he had to report into the pit area. Waldron takes it into turn number nine. He's being challenged now as Ricky Rudd has moved up onto the rear bumper of Tim Richmond. Richmond and Rudd wanting to run right onto that rear bumper as they come back onto the main straightaway here at the start-finish line. Waldron now drags them along. They're actually in a draft at the present time. Richmond cocks the hammer on the automobile. Runs up very close. He's within a car length. He's within a striking distance on Waltrip. Into turn two. And Richmond puts it off into the dirt. Moves out of the line momentarily. They move now through the upper portion of the S's. 
moving towards turn six. Moving into the quarter, Walter is being shouted very closely by Richmond and Rudd. Well, Bonnie runs very safely, two car lengths back. Richmond is re really trying to get within striking distance of Waltrip, but Waltrip keeps covering down as much as he possibly can. He uses up a lot of racetrack as he goes onto that long back straightaway. Bill, watch for Richmond to make a move at the end of the shoot here. It looks like he's trying to make a, a maybe a pass at the end of the shoot under braking. That's his favorite place on this track to pass. Well, the long back straightaway, 4,000 feet long, and you don't have to back off to go through that dog leg at the entrance to turn nine. Look at Rudd. Rudd makes the move. Rod is down to the inside of Tim Richmond. Richmond almost pushes him off into the dirt. He gets the better of the two lines there, moves Richmond high to the outside. They'll fade out of that outside wall as they come out of turn nine. And Ricky Rudd in car number three has moved into second place at an exchange for positions. For Richmond, he'll have to settle for third momentarily. Terry Labonte will continue to run in fourth place, and Jeff Bodine is now up to fifth. Bodine on the charge in his Pontiac. Junior Johnson says that Bodine is due to win any time. It could come this afternoon here in the Budweiser 400. Certainly the car that's out front right now and apparently is going to dominate these opening laps unless he's challenged by Ricky Rudd is Darrell Waltrip. Waltrip's bright yellow and white car introduced this year in New York at the end of last season when they had the Winston Cup points dinner up there. And it was a swanky affair. Brought this brand new color scheme into NASCAR racing after racing several years with a green and white car. And Waltrip takes him down that long back straightaway. As they come under the bridge, Ricky Rudd may very well set himself up to make that pass just as he did last lap on Richmond. Now he dives down to the inside. Down to the inside. Hits the inside speed bumps, washes out just a little bit. Slides a little high, but he covers down so well. Waltrip falls to second place. We've got a new leader here in the Budweiser 400. It's Ricky Rudd, still looking for his first victory on the NASCAR Winston Cup Tour. The Chesapeake, Virginia driver is in front of the Richard Childress prepared car. Number three. We're going to take a look once again at Ricky Rudd. Passing Darrell Walter right now. Lawrence, you can tell he's coming in there. He's coming in very hot. He goes by the braking markers on the outside of the track and he dives in. Look at him. That's very, very difficult. Nice move. It's awfully early in the race for that kind of racing, wouldn't you think, Bill? Well, obviously, he's calling on his past go kart racing experience. He used to race go karts a long time ago before he came into Grand National Racing. But he's got the Piedmont Airlines pacemaker in the lead right now. And he rolls out of turn nine, takes it out against that outside retaining wall, angles the car back over towards the start finish line, right by Harold Kinder, the flagman, dives into turn number one. We'll be back with more racing from Riverside International Raceway right after this. Racing on the Grand Prix circuit is living life on the edge. Silverstone, England is the next stop for Formula One cars and their fearless drivers. Auto Racing 83 presents the British Grand Prix, Wednesday on your total sports network, ESPN. Auto Racing 83 puts you on the right track with off-road racing. It's motorized mayhem from Pomona, here Monday on ESPN. A little earlier today, we had the opportunity to ride around this famed facility with Joe Rutman and Pat Patterson. We're going to take the folks at home for a ride around the racetrack with Joe Rutman. This is a 2.62 mile road course. Joe, we're heading for the start finish line. Tell me what's going through your mind. Well, right here, you're trying to gear up for uh, the bridge area of the track, which is a real tricky area. You've just shifted from third into fourth. You're running probably in a neighborhood of 85 miles an hour, 90 miles an hour. You want to you want to hold the line extremely tight here as you come up over the bridge. Hold the car in as close to the barrier as possible, and uh, you let the car float out. Obviously, we had some barriers here, which uh, does not occur during the race time. Uh, we'd, we'd run over this poor guard here if we, that would be the case. So at uh, this point, you'd be uh, gathering the car back up to the, to the extreme left of the course. And uh, you, there's some white stripes on the track, which denotes uh, braking and uh, shifting points uh, for you to relate to. This is one shift point. Another shift point here, if you're working good, you'd be back into third gear right here. You'd be running for the low side of the track, the ripple strips to the right and uh, picking up power at this point. 
in the car, the centrifugal force of the car, the way the car is taking to the outside of the course here, a lot of dirt. You want to stay away from the dirt because that's not the thing to be playing on right now. You hold the car in extremely tight to the left here because uh, you're coming up on an extremely blind corner here and you're really concerned about, you know, objects that might be in front of the in front of your race car at this point. How fast are we going, Joe? We're running probably right now, we're probably in the neighborhood of 100 miles an hour and gathering speed at all times. We're running in third gear and uh, you want to pull that line extremely tight and you're back to the left side of the course now. You want to hit the ripple strips on the left and now your major concern is, is a, you're, you're looking at turn six, you, you, you're, you've got a tight line back to the right again here and uh, I would think that uh, at this point is probably the toughest part of the course coming up here as you hit this uh, last set of ripple strips here on the right. You're on the brakes extremely hard. We're, we're pulling the car down to about 65 miles an hour at the top of the hill. We're coming back into second gear. The ripple strips on the left, extreme left. Uh, we let the car stay to the left so we got a good, uh, good motion around the turn six. Uh, you hit those ripple strips on the right here. You're starting to pick the power back up. This is an extremely critical area right here. You lose the car here, and you're going to be in the guardrail. Uh, as you, you pull off this part of the course, you get just a little bit of roller coaster effect. You're, you're downhill, and the car is accelerating extremely good. You're heading toward extremely flat corner uh, ahead, and uh, you're still in, th in second gear at this point. You're turning the engine at maximum RPM somewhere in the neighborhood of 82, 8,500 RPM. If, if the crew chief doesn't realize you're turning that many RPM, <laughs> you jam the brakes on here extremely hard here, and you, you fly on the extreme right-hand side of the course to pick up the ripple strips in this area, and you're starting to pick up power, and it's still remaining in second gear, and as you power off of this corner here, you're still in second. You, you jump to the left side of the course here and uh, hit the ripple strips here on the left, and now you feed the car back to the right-hand side of the course, and uh, you're, you're talking RPM of 7,500, 8,000, and you'd probably hit uh, third gear right in this area. Okay, when you're going back down through the back chute right now, do you notice anything? Is this a chance for you to take a break, uh, you know, from the from the lap that you're running? No, you really don't. You'd like to think so. Obviously, this uh, this tape is run at approximately 30 miles an hour. This part of the track right here, we're probably approaching 120 miles an hour. Just as we get to the bridge, we're probably at 155. So obviously, you you got your mind on on your business because now you've shifted the car into third gear. You're watching attack because you don't want to over rev the the engine. And in this area here, you, you pull the car into high gear, uh, and uh, now you're, you know, you're gathering up maximum speed as you head underneath the bridge area. Is this the best place to pass someone? Oh, picking up a draft right here. The bump causes you a little bit of trouble, but you're going to try to pick up a draft. To, uh, hopefully, you're leading, but let's say you're running second or third. You're trying to pick up a draft and shoot by the guy here at the bridge. You've got to be careful now because we've got to be at the right, extreme right-hand side of the course because uh, there's a dog leg coming up here. It's wide open if you're running good. It's, these are just relation points. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, there's a the white area that you're, you're picking up on, and uh, you have to be extremely tight here as you break around the dog leg. And the numbers on the left denote you know, what you can do with your car. If you've got a poor handling car, you're going to back off here at, at 4. If you've got a better handling car, you're going to come down to 3. And uh, the guys that's really brave might get down to 2. I've never seen 2 before, but uh, <laughs> you're, you're on the brakes extremely hard. You run 170 mile an hour. You're on the, you stand on the brakes, you get down to approximately one here, and you're back into third gear, which helps deaccelerate the car some more. And uh, at this point, you're trying to you know, ne negotiate the turn at the extreme bottom of the track here, kick up a little dust, cause the guy a little bit of trouble behind you if you can, you know. <laughs> it makes the course a little slicker. And I would say at this point here, as you, you enter the Budweiser signs you're trying to pick up, obviously you're not thinking of Budweiser, but you, you're picking up speed right here. And uh, this is a, the longest period of time you're into a corner. This is the most critical part of the, the course you run on because you're in the corner so long. And uh, obviously you come to the outside here and you're a little concerned because now we're, you're setting to the outside of the car and you're close at this Winston sign. You're about six inches away from the guardrail yourself, so you're a little concerned. And now you're looking at the start-finish line and, and you, you're moving over toward the right-hand side of the, the course here and you're, and you're picking up uh, fourth gear just about the start-finish line before you come back up over the bridge. Think you can get the checkered flag that the guy's going to throw? Well, that's what it's all for. You know, that's the first guy. That's the stripe right there. That's the most important uh, aspect of it. If you have a little trouble, you, you pull off the course like this and you explain to the mechanics uh, maybe what happened. Okay, thanks, Joe Rutman. Well, Joe Rutman, unfortunately, spun out to bring out this yellow flag, and he gave Pat Patterson a tour of the track earlier today here at Riverside, California. The last four winners of this particular event have been Tim Richmond, Daryl Waltrip, Waltrip, and Bobby Allison. So Waltrip winning two of the last four of these races, and Allison 
and uh, Richmond sharing the other. We'll be back right after this at Riverside, California, and the Budweiser 400. Well, this is the ninth lap of caution here at Riverside International Raceway, a rather lengthy caution, Lauren, being caused by the track breaking up in two turns of the road course at turn six and turn eight. This was newly resurfaced in the last uh, several months here. And on Friday night and Saturday night, after practice and qualifying, they brought the construction company back in here to patch the area that was breaking up over the last several days under the pressure of these Grand National Racing cars. This is one of the serious problems with new pavement, and I understand that this was just paved two days ago, Bill. These are the heaviest cars that Les Richter has here uh, that run on the cars uh, on this pavement. Most of the cars, uh, such as sports car racing or IndyCar, will weigh 1,800 pounds up to 2,400 pounds. Here we have uh, a car racing around that weighs 3,700 pounds, maybe a gross weight of close to 4,000 pounds. And so it takes, with the heat of the sun, the fresh asphalt, and the heaviness of the cars, we get this breakup of asphalt. Very dangerous, very slippery, uh, broken windshields, cut tires, etc. Well, they're passing through the area right now that they're having that problem in. Bodine, 88, the leader, Harry Gant runs second in 33, then Ricky Rudd, Bobby Allison, and then Terry Labonte in fifth, and Terry's got a small problem. Yes, I understand that they interviewed Dale Inman, and he said it was a slight oil leak that only appeared when he made the transition from a left to a right, like through the S's, and that it's not a major leak. Uh, it will be only minor, and it just puffs out a little smoke at certain times. So let's, we'll keep an eye on that and see if, in fact, it does stay as a minor leak. Well, we spoke with Bobby Allison, the driver of car number 22, who's running up there in the top five at the present time. If Riverside posed any special problem here. Well, I like the track. Uh, Riverside's unusual for us. It's a road course. We uh, normally run the high bank ovals back in the southeast and uh, other parts of the country, but uh, I consider it a, a kind of a pleasant change of pace. I look forward to it. and. I've had some success here. I, I like the place. Bobby Allison is well known for his short track endeavors. Bobby, are you still putting in a lot of time racing all the different tracks across the nation? Well, I really do enjoy that, and uh, I get to meet a lot of the fans uh, firsthand by doing it. Uh, it's been something that's just been part of my life for lots and lots of years, and I'm still doing a lot of it. Strategy for Bobby Allison when it comes down to the green flag. Where do you hope to be tomorrow? Well, I'm qualified back a little further than I'd like. Uh, I know it's going to be kind of a struggle to try to get up front, but uh, up front's where we got to be. So uh, our strategy is already kind of mapped out for us. Uh, we're going to have to try to move forward. Well, for Bobby Allison, who races all across the country, sometimes he races four or five times a week, flies his own airplane to those short tracks to put in appearances. And he always puts on a good show for the fans, and he always has time for the fans following those races. He's such a strong-hearted competitor. But yet, he's not been able to capture a Grand National Championship. The one thing that has perhaps eluded him more than any other quest he's gone after in his entire career. He's presently has 1,881 points. He's leading in the Western Cup points chase, 185 points in front of Richard Petty. He started racing back in, in 1961. He's won over $4 million in career earnings. That's a, a real credit to his driving ability and another thing about Bobby you mentioned he travels all over the country he flies into small tracks and makes appearances and I think that's one of the reasons that he has been voted year after year as the most popular driver in Grand National Racing certainly a credit to the hard work and the love of the sport that he had this is Bobby Allison we'll be back at Riverside in one minute green flag was thrown for the cars over at turn eight as they came onto that long straightaway. We see Harry Gant fighting off the challenge of Ricky Rudd as they come through turn number nine, which is a reverse running order through this quarter as what they're normally accustomed to. Normally they would run the other way through the banking. This time it's a reverse type of a environment. 
88 goes by. He's your leader, Bodine. Bodine has led practically every race he has won so far this season. Harry Gant pulls into his slipstream as they go through the S's. Ricky Rudd runs in third place. And Bobby Allison holds down fourth. Terry Labonte continues to run fifth. Richard Petty in the 43 car, the Pontiac, he's in the hunt. And Herschel McGriff, the old-timer, 55 years old, is running right there in the top 10 and is probably set to challenge. Like we said earlier, he won the Grand American race, which was run as a prelude to this event here this afternoon. What a great warm-up for him. And Herschel, anytime he gets up that close, I know Herschel would dearly love to come here and take this away from the, from the good old boys, and there's no victor that would be more of a crowd pleaser than Herschel. Well, certainly he's one of the hottest running West Coast drivers as Ronnie Thomas, the young independent driver out of Christiansburg, Virginia in the 41 car, takes it back out into the wars. Down that long back straightaway, your leaders come through the dogleg. We're working the 22nd lap at the present time. The die guard machine is out front. Jeff Bodine proving his worth right now on car number 88. And I stand to be corrected, that is not a die guard racing car. It's carrying the colors that die guard had last year, the Gatorade sponsorship. It's a Cliff Stewart entry. Harry Gant down to the inside. Gant tries to make a move, almost rolls into the rear bumper as they go through turn one in the dog leg that takes him to turn number two. But Gant is setting the challenge. Bobby Allison is right behind Ricky Rudd. There's a little separation among those cars. It's still early in the going. 95 laps will constitute this Budweiser 400. But Bodine likes to run up front. He's always been a front running car. His father ran a racetrack. He's had a lot of experience on short tracks, and I think short track experience pays off on a road course for a guy that doesn't normally do this week after week. Exactly, and Darrell Waltrip, who is the master of the short tracks, I mean, he's done almost with Junior Johnson, no one can touch them, and here again, he qualified new track record and on the pole, so very definitely short track experience really pays off at Riverside. Well, Bodine started from the fifth position in the field, and now he is running up front, and he is our leader at the present time as they go down that long 4,000-foot back straightaway. Harry Gant is in hot pursuit. Gant out of Taylorsville, North Carolina, a carpenter by profession, used to build a lot of houses up there around Hidden Night in Taylorsville, his hometown, which is above Charlotte, North Carolina, and he is in hot pursuit as they come out of turn nine. They sweep the cars up uh, out against the outside wall and Gant is really hounding the 88 car of Bodine as he runs within a half a car length and sets to challenge him as they come into turn two. Thinks better of it, falls back behind Bodine. Bodine ran over the inside Apex safety markers, and you can see the car momentarily lose balance. As they cross over, you notice that on certain of the ripple bars, they try to avoid other cars are running over them. We'll have to see if, in fact, later on, the, the cars that run over the ripple bars have trouble with their suspension. They have car 96. It looks like they have a tire problem with the outside tires. Well, car number 96 made an earlier pit stop and once again finds itself back in That's with Jim, some problems. That's Jim Bowne, who had body contact earlier with Neil Bonnet, and it could be that part of that, I see they're beating on the fender down there, so I would say that possibly that body contact early on has caused them some, some more problems. Well, Jim Bowne, the brother of Chuck Bowne, who runs up in the northeast section in the late model sportsman division uh, out of Portland, Oregon. He was the best qualifying Winston West driver. Qualified at 114.135 miles per hour, and uh, that was seventh on the grid. Bobby Allison has gotten by Ricky Rutt. He now rides in third place, and Allison drops it over in the dirt as he is trying to pick up some steam. They're through a very fast portion of the course, but also a very treacherous one as they run that portion of this road course, which is almost like an oval in reverse. And Allison is on the charge in car number 22, but Harry Gant is down to the inside of 88. Bodine almost pulled it off. Bodine covers himself down very, very well as he snakes the car through the S's, tries to straighten out this portion of the road course comes up he's coming to turn six right now he'll be going under heavy braking shifting the car down he's into third gear shifts into second right there swings the car over to the right brings the car through the short chute pat patterson is standing by in the pits with the junior johnson crewman jeff hammond i'm with jeff hammond on the junior johnson crew a problem on the daryl walter car in the early goings jeff what exactly happened well 
Tim Richmond and Daryl were racing, and uh, Tim and them got together, and uh, it kind of knocked our toe in out, the, you know, the front end sitting on the tires. So uh, when we had that caution flag last time, we decided to go ahead and come back in here in the early stages and kind of get that trued up. And uh, right after that, we were out there riding around a caution flag, and Daryl run over something up on the racetracks with debris, rocks, you know, cut a tire down. So we, rather than take a chance, we come on in, change four tires, and we didn't really lose anything. And that way, we had a little peace of mind. Everything else is fine right now. We're just you know, playing it by ear, working our way back up the track. Was there any co was there any cosmetic damage to the car? Uh, just a little bit of uh, some tire marks and a little wrinkle to the door. It's nothing really serious. Uh, okay, you didn't go a you didn't go a lap down. No, everything else is fine. We're just at the tail end of the field, you know, more or less. We're working our way back up the track. Daryl's just playing it by ear. So we got a lot of racing to run. Okay, Daryl Walter back at the back of the pack right now, but apparently got the situation under control. Well, in the early going, Darrell Waltrip having a mishap with Tim Richmond. That's cost him some time as he's running now back in the pack as uh, Jeff Hammond and Pat Patterson just discussed. But for Bodie, he is up front, exactly where he belongs. Originally from Chamont, New York, now residing in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina. His wife, Kathy, is one of the most colorful Grand National wives. He was the champion spark plug rookie of the year last season. Been racing Grand National since 1979. He has won two poles so far in 83. He won two last year in 82. He's presently 18th in points. He's had a lot of hard luck this season. Has failed to finish a lot of races, and he's still looking for that first win in Grand National competition. Scott Miller is into the pit area on the 51 car. Scott started towards the tail end of the pack and had his problems in qualifying. But he's in. He's getting tires on the inside which is to the uh, right at this facility. Ricky Rudd making a pass on Harry Gant. He's trying to take back a position. Rudd and Gant battling each other through turn nine as they give chase to Bodine. They're racing door handle to door handle. He almost sticks it into the quarter panel. Look at both of those drivers bring it out of turn nine. Fish tailing as they come onto the main straightaway and by the start finish line, we see a yellow flag out. Yellow is on the track. Harold Kinder waves yellow here at the start finish line. Current leaders here at Riverside International Raceway, Bodine, your leader, Ricky Rudd being scored in second place, Harry Gant third, Bobby Allison is fourth, Terry Labonte runs fifth. We're under yellow at Riverside. We'll be back with more racing from Riverside International Raceway right after this. We're working the seventh lap of the yellow flag brought out by Randy Becker, the drive car, driver of car number 64 out of Highlands, California. Lauren, uh, a lot of uh, liquids on the racing surface. Yes, that's right near the entrance to the bridge there on a very fast part of the course, and that will make it very difficult under traffic, so we'll have to keep an eye on that as we go back to green. Well, Becker out of Highlands, California, going out of the race in the early going, causing seven laps of a yellow flag. The leader, Joe Rutman, now shows his strength and he's being followed by the 0-4 car, Herschel McGriff. McGriff has been moving up steadily in this race, has been very persistent. Rutman, who had his problems early and made a pit stop, is back on the uh, lead lap and is the leader as he moves through turn number nine right now with the Levi Garrett car up front. He moves through nine, he's being chased, but look at that battle back in the pack. Two cars almost together, and it's Tim Richmond charging through, followed by Terry Labonte. Now, Ricky Rudd makes a charge. Ricky Rudd gets by Herschel McGriff as they get into the S's. Meanwhile, Rutman continues to run up front, followed by Gant, then Rudd, then McGriff runs fourth. Look at the swing of those cars through that wavy area of the track, known as the S's here. Rutman, Gant, Rudd, McGriff, and Earnhardt, your top five. So Earnhardt has also been moving up very steadily. Dale has done a super job of keeping his car out of trouble. As we see Harry Gant trying to make a move, thinks about it, there's not room there. That's only one lane wide at turn six. Well, if you could be door handle to door handle going in there, you could possibly get by because you'd make the driver on the outside of the track actually wash out and lose the adhesion characteristics, make him slow down under braking and make him fall back into second place. But Rutman won't have anything to do with that as he drags the entire field down that long 4,000 foot back straight away and through the dog leg. They're coming under the bridge right now. They'll make the dog leg to the left. They're in fourth gear, running approximately 185 miles an hour. Now hard on the brakes goes Rutman as he comes into turn nine, drops the car over into the dirt. But look at Harry Gant. Gant takes a high side line. Gant goes out in front. Gant rim rides out of turn nine, brings out against the outside wall. 
The car doesn't falter. He's dragging along Ricky Rudd. It's almost like something happened to Rutman. First, second, and third place change in the blink of an eye. Tim Rutschman is back up on the charge now as he's behind Dale Earnhardt. But Gant is your leader on the Skull Bandit. Here in Alameda's backyard in sunny Southern California, he's now setting the pace. But look at Richmond, he's up in the dirt. A tremendous driving style for this hard charger who has driven in road races before, has had any experience, used to drive a Super B's, used to be an outlaw sprinter up in his native Ohio. He's going to put a move on Dale Earnhardt here very soon. Matter of fact, I... the inside right now. Look at, let's see if he can wash him out. He's out of camera view as the camera is on uh, Rutman. It'll be interesting to see how they come down the back straightaway. He got by Dale Earnhardt. He got by Earnhardt under heavy braking at turn eight. But your leaders are coming by the bridge right now. You can see the, the oil absorbent in the air there, which makes it very dangerous. It's hard on the uh, vision, and it's very difficult, so it must be very slippery there. Slow traffic, slow traffic. Almost blocked our two front-running cars. They split around car number 51, and able to maintain his lead, Harry Gant, but drags along the Ricky Rudd automobile as the 51 car heads the pits, Scott Miller. But look at Richmond, Richmond's on the charge. As he pulls to the outside of the 98 car, Joe Rutman makes a pass in turn one, moves into third place, and he has really got the wick turned up on the number 27 Raymond Beetle entry. What a place to pass. The most dangerous, fast corner on the course. Tim goes by on the outside, which is unheard of. Tremendous pass. Great driver. Richmond, the fastest car on the track right now. Got that Harold Elliott engine tuned up. It's tweak. It's running. It's strong. Through the short shoot, he heads for turn number eight. The two leaders battle with each other. Ricky Rudd on the fly. The Piedmont pacemaker pulls right behind the 33 car. He noses him in the quarter panel. Almost spins Harry Gant out. Gant comes onto that long back straightaway. The 33 car tries to pull a little advantage. He is being hotly pursued by two young Lions. One of those, Ricky Rudd, still looking for his first win, and the other one is the guy that won two times last season. They come under the bridge. Ricky Rudd, Rudd, he's under him. He makes the pass, going into turn nine, stands hard on the brake, turns hard to the right now. He gets through there, but look at Richmond. Richmond is there. Richmond threatens. Richmond rides to the outside, takes the long line through turn nine. A battle up front here at Riverside, California, the Budweiser 400. Yeah. Richmond Hounds, car number 33, Gant. Richmond says he likes the track. It's easy for him to run. It's suited to his style. And believe you me, he's putting the pressure on the 33, Harry Gant, Skull Bandit, right now. We got a tremendous battle going on back for fourth place right now, Bill. We've got to keep an eye on that because they were three abreast going through turn two up there. See if we can pick up that great battle. One car trailing a little smoke right now. Looks like it could be Terry Labonte. He's been having a boiling problem since the early going. As he goes into turn six, manages to clear himself of traffic. Meanwhile, your leaders head for turn eight. 1,645 feet above sea level, the second highest spot on this racetrack. Moving around now, off into the dirt momentarily goes Harry Gant, kicks up some smoke. Down the back straightaway. Let's see what Tim Richmond can do. With Harry Gant, he shadows him down just like a boxer right now. Runs in the draft, pulls over to the inside of the corner. Coming under the bridge, he's got him. He's moved into second place. He is turning some phenomenal laps right now, and he has really got the wick turned up on the 27 car. Moving around right now, this is a fine run. He was disappointed at Darlington in the Rebel 500. He found himself leading on the first lap after winning the pole, but he crashed going down the back straightaway after the engine expired. Now, he dives into turn one, and he's behind Ricky Rudd, your fourth place runner, Terry Labonte, fifth. Rutman, sixth, as Allison, seventh, is uh, Dale Earnhardt. Herschel McGriff rides eighth. Your ninth place runner is Bill Elliott at car number nine, and look at Darrell Waltrip. Waltrip is moving up in car 11, followed by Neil Bonnet. 
Kyle Petty has suffered some damage somewhere on the racetrack. Obviously, he's nosed into someone. Jeff Bodine, who's been in the pits for several laps with some type of problem, is coming back out onto the racetrack right now in car number 88, spending several laps over at the transporter with some bad problems. I believe Pat Patterson is standing by in the pit area with a report on that. I'm standing at the rear of the Jeff Bodine pit, the car number 88. Up until a few laps ago, Bodine was leading this event. He broke a brake line on the left-hand side of the car. He took the car to the garage to repair it. As you can see, the pit's empty right now. They do have the car back on the track right now. He's going to be a quite a few laps down. It's a tough break for one of the hard-charged rookies that has been out here, 1982 Rookie of the Year, and now he's going to be a few laps down going back into this event. Tough break for Jeff Bodine. Bodine has been out front in almost every race he's run this season, but he's had considerable bad luck. A challenge for the lead. It's now Richmond who dominated both races last year. Streaks over to the inside. Both of these drivers will go under braking in turn nine. Richmond rides to the high side. Rudd fights him off. They're door handle to door handle right now as they come through turn nine. Both of these drivers want the lead. As they come out, Richmond goes to the outside wall. This time he will take the line as they go into turn one. Richmond takes the lead by a front fender as Rudd will be relegated to the second position. But now Rudd's got the inside. No, Tim maintained first spot. He covered down very well going in to the second turn by getting back over on the line. Had he stayed out just a little bit longer, Rudd would have been able to get back by him. But Richmond is going for broke right now. Richmond in the 27 car, owned by the drag racer, Raymond Beetle, the Blue Max racing team, is up front, leading by three car leads as they go through turn six in the 1,650-foot elevated position here at Riverside, California. We'll be back at Riverside International Raceway at the Budweiser 400 in a minute. Your leader's coming down the back straightaway, and they have... Uh, garnered more distance over the third place runner Harry Gant and it looks like Ricky Rudd is set to challenge the 27 car again now Rudd may have been laying back several laps trying to uh, cool his tires down a little bit to see Richmond's driving style and perhaps pick out an area where he thinks that perhaps he could overtake the lead car Richmond comes out of nine rides it right out against that concrete wall right behind him comes the Monte Carlo SS of Ricky Rudd down into the dirt, going into turn one. Richmond, Richmond trying to apex the corner just a little too tightly, dropped it over into the dirt, kicking up some debris onto the windshield of Ricky Rudd. That's a very dangerous thing because that's where the rocks can come out. You can cut a tire out there. Last year, that's what happened to Allison. He was out in there, cut a tire, cost him the race. This could happen to Tim. It is a quick way around, but it is a gamble. Well, Rudd draws back down on the rear bumper now. Uh, Richmond through the short shoot. He seems to be able to gather up a little uh, distance right there, but they also have a slow car in front of them. That's Buddy Arrington. And that slow car may be slowing Richmond down just enough to allow Rudd to draw up to the rear bumper because he didn't want to pass him under braking or in that corner. He wanted to pass him on the straightaway. Use the draft. And, of course, Tim stayed behind Buddy as long as he could to get as much draft down the chute. They come under the bridge. They take that left-hander in there at 185 miles an hour. They run up on a slow car. It's right in front of them. And of course, that's the car that looks very similar to the one that Darrell Waltrip has driven in previous seasons. That's Bill Schmidt out of Redding, California. And he's a racetrack promoter over at Redding. And he heads down the pit lane as your leaders cross the strike for another line. Left. We have another accident. Over, it looks like in the S's. We'll see how that affects the leaders as they come through. Lots and lots of dust, which is a real hazard. Car off course, facing our camera at the present time. And there come your leaders by right now. They're really slowing down. Car number 13 is off course. That's Stephen Wheeler out of Bakersville, California. Wheeler, off course in car number 13. He uh, got in the show. In the 25th starting position, driving a Buick, qualified at 110 miles per hour, and he brings out the yellow flag. The 48 laps remaining in the race here at Riverside, California. With Stephen Wheeler sitting on the edge of the raceway. Yeah. 
here's a look at exactly what happened with Steven Wheeler. Wheeler just flat lost it, got it over into the loose dirt. Fortunately, spinning around, there's no traffic. Now, Bill, you can see the dust there, and if there was a car coming through there at speed, there'd be no way they could have seen him. Fortunately, the car was able to continue off the road. Otherwise, that could be a very serious incident. The smartest thing he did was quickly get the car over off the asphalt and onto the dirt. Stephen Wheeler, an oil field machine shop operator. This is his fourth race he's ever run in Grand National Competition. He used to race at Formula Ford in Sports Car Club of America action. Got a problem on the engine there. Pontiac. And that's the 52 car. Jimmy Means. Means obviously breaking a line to the radiator. And the coolant comes rushing out. The car running hot. His mechanics administering to the car. Hopefully they can get him back into the competition. This was a long tow for Jimmy Means, the driver of car number 52. And he's an independent's independent. He said he was looking forward to just finishing about 12th or so. Finished 18th, he'd feel like he, he ran the race. He's had a good year. He's in the, up in the standings. Uh, he's having a good year. I just hope he can get it back together and finish up and get as many points as possible for this long tow. We're halfway at the present time. But for Jimmy Means, he said if he could finish eight he would feel like he had won the race here at riverside california he's presently 10th in points and is a real good run for young independent drivers never runs new tires always runs scuffs he said he would like to know what it would be like to race a competitive car here at riverside international raceway a battle for the lead ricky rudd takes the lead again skates by tim richmond under braking at turn nine so we have a new leader here at riverside california as we past the halfway mark, working into the second half of the race. But look at Harry Gant just riding there, carefully observing. And Terry Labonte's doing likewise, a fine run for him. Richard Petty's been into somebody's uh, rear quarter panel, possibly Bobby Allison's. Here's the way it happened when Ricky Rudd took over the lead. Rudd moved over to the right dove down to the inside and just flat blew by Tim Richmond under heavy braking and look how deep he has to drive the car into the corner. I noticed in that last lap that Harry Gant as he came out on turn nine the car was almost sideways coming out so and we have Darrell Waltrip coming in for an unscheduled pit stop let's see if they've got a problem there looks like they're going to change the outside tires. Darrell Waltrip in on the 11 car. Hi, this is Harry again. We'll be back to Riverside Raceway in one minute. Waltrip has returned to the action on the 11 car. The defending Winston Cup Grand National Champion back in the contest. He's been having his problems here this afternoon. An early pit stop cost him. He fell back to the end of the field. He worked himself back up into the top 10. And once again, he's had to pay a visit to the pits under the green. The traffic is really coming into effect here now as they catch slower cars. There's only one line through these narrow turns. It's not like on an oval track where you can run three or four wide. They're just one little ribbon of asphalt. Well, now they're onto the surface of the uh, track that will accommodate racing three or four abreast. It's quite wide down that 3,000 foot back straightaways. They passed Joe Rutman's car. Rutman obviously expired something in the drivetrain and has parked it. They moved by Summer McKnight and now they're running up on another slow car. They're moving by Oh boy, look at the traffic going into turn nine. Gant threads the needle right there. That's a great pass because he Beautiful put that other pass. car between he and Terry Labonte. Now look at Ricky Rudd driving to the outside of Trevor Boys out of Alberta, Canada. Boys racing his first season on the Winston Cup Grand National Tour. He used to race Formula Vs and midgets and tried to qualify at Indy several years ago but failed to make the field after crashing in practice. And Summer McKnight in uh, the 83 car was the one that was the result of all that. He got passed on inside, outside. I'm sure that uh, he got a real thrill there in turn nine. He had a rear few mirror full of uh, automobiles passing on the inside and the outside. Ricky Rudd, because of the traffic, was able to pick up an advantage there over the second place rudder as he moves through turn six. That's a very treacherous corner. You go through there quite slow, but one little slip will send you into that outside retaining wall. If you crest a hill there, Bill, and as you go around the corner, the car gets light, and that's what happens. It carries you right towards what they call the Armco, and it's very unforgiving. Herschel McGriff, 0-3 into the pit area, and Herschel McGriff, who was running in the top 10, pays a visit to the pits under the green. For some of these drivers, this may be a scheduled pit stop. 
for fresh tires and fuel. Travis Carter told me earlier, 28 laps would be about the distance before you would have to come in and refresh your tires and take on a new tank of gas. But Darrell Waltrip goes by our location here, high in the tower at the start finish line. Meanwhile, Ricky Rudd, look at the advantage he now has. Tim Richmond has fallen off the pace somewhere, and Richmond obviously has expired. We said we saw the telltale trail of smoke. And I noticed that Terry Labonte was gone from that because Terry was right here with this pack, and Terry is now gone. Well, coming to the stripe, Ricky Rudd is your leader. He carries, and Harry Gant is down the pit lane. Yes. We have a crash. Tim Richmond involved in the crash. Terry Labonte involved in the crash. Your second place runner has been involved. Trevor Boys involved in the crash. So as they were moving by, Trevor Boys overtaking him, the young driver out of Alberta, Canada. Terry Labonte crashes along with Richmond. Richmond has his car back under power, trying to make it back around to the pits. Well, the yellow is only out at that turn. Yellow is not all the way out around this facility. Harry Gant has taken the opportunity to pay a visit to the pits. The interesting note is that your leaders, Ricky Rudd, but continues to be the leader, and the second place runner will possibly be Richard Petty as he has moved up. Richmond comes in through the back door of the pits. I don't think it's going to bother him that they're going to assess him a 30-second penalty, but he would rather come in through the back door, the short way, into the pits here at Riverside, California, than have to continue on around through turn nine. Now, there's your leader through turn nine right now, Ricky Rudd. And your second place runner is Richard Petty. And we have a yellow all the way around now. Now Rudd takes the opportunity with the yellow flag coming out yellow to pay a visit to the pit area. He's got to have a smile on his face right now as he looked in the rearview mirror. Richard Petty stays on the track, but the leader rolls down the pit lane. I he believe Richard, down. he stops right now and is stopping the tire going up on the jacks, the left-hand tires going on the car. Richard Petty will be probably Petty next time by. I believe Petty is a lap down because of that former incident. He had to change a tire because of the shunt, so he is a lap down. Well, it's wholesale pit stop time for Dale Earnhardt into the pit area. I believe Harry now, Harry Gant will take over the lead. This will show him as the leader, 33. Well, Gant came into the pits before the yellow flag came out. Very smartly, Travis Carter brought him in. He was serviced and put back into the action. But quickly, Ricky Rudd coming back up to speed as he rolls out of the pit area. Another one of the front runners in, Bobby Allison with an undamaged car is in for service on car number 22. Kyle Petty is in. But Rudd is back on the surface. And look at there. Trevor Boys and Terry Labonte stand by as helpless spectators as they observe the action just beyond the bridge. We'll be back in moments with more of the exciting action of the Budweiser 400 from Riverside International Raceway. winner of this year's Daytona 500. You'll see more NASCAR Grand National Races on ESPN this summer than any other network. Watch for us. From stocks to sprints, Auto Racing 83 steers you right. Here at your source for sports, ESPN. It's really a shame that that car, number 44, was wrecked here at Riverside International Raceway. That was a brand new car that Terry Labonte brought here for the Billy Hagan Racing Team. It had been recently constructed and just finished off last Thursday night. He came here, he said, man, I've got a car that's set up strictly for road racing. This is an opportunity. He started right up there in third place. He helped break the old track record. Then it all comes to an end in a crash with Trevor Boys and Tim Richmond. Of course, Richmond and Labonte running for position in this afternoon's Budweiser 400. Of course, one of the sponsors on the Terry Labonte uh, car, John Schneider from the Dukes of Hazard. Riverside, California is not too far from Hollywood, California, and one of the people, one of the people that is always close by the racing is John Snyder of the Dukes of Hazard. John, you're in a part sponsor on Terry Labonte's car, right? Yes, I am. I'm an associate sponsor, and you see, I got my shirt and everything. Uh, it's great. I started this year in the first race with a Daytona 500. Got involved there. I've been involved singing for Budweiser at the different. Boy, that's loud. 
the different at the different uh, fairs and different things that they have, and it's grown into this. Who knows? Maybe one day I can. Uh, not only just sit around and watch the cars, maybe I can get in one. That'd be a lot of fun. You have a thing called the Celebrity Machine. Yeah, uh, here, look, look, there. See? There it is, right there on the back. Tell me a little bit about that, John. Well, we fix and sell exotic sports cars. We uh, fix uh, Maseratis, Ferraris, Lamborghinis, and uh, also we make, I've got a, a 1966 Corvette, and uh, we've made that go a lot faster than it was ever supposed to go. Uh, I guess we, we fix them more than we sell them, but it's kind of my hobby turned into a business. Uh, I had a, a couple of cars that didn't run very well, and I found a mechanic, and he needed a place to do his, uh, do his work, so I opened up a shop. His name is Gary Kirsten. We've got two shops now, one in Burbank and one in Studio City. Well, sounds great. Has Terry got a good chance of winning today? Oh, you bet. It's even better than a good chance. He's going to win. Okay, and, John. You know, he had a track record for about a minute and a half, and then the other two guys beat him, but we had a bad engine in the car at that time. We put a brand new engine in. We're going to walk away with it. Okay. John Slatter, the Dukes of Hazard here, working on Terry Labonte's car number 44. Don Waterman in car number 38 follows Sterling Marlin back out on the racing service. Glenn Francis. And Sterling looks like he might be having a little problem coming up to speed after suffering problems with overheating on his uh, entry here, the Roger Hamby car. Meanwhile, we continue to clean up the racing surface here at Riverside International Raceway. In just a moment, we'll be returning here to sunny Southern California for more of this exciting action in the Budweiser 400. The green flag unfurls at turn eight. The charge down that long back straightaway. You can see him overtaking the pace car before they reach the bridge there. For Ricky Rudd, he is your leader. Harry Gant rides in second place. Bobby Allison is third as they move by Sumner McKnight. McKnight moves over to the inside, allows Allison by along with Earnhardt on the 15 car. Now, look out. Gant is loose. Gant gets up into the marbles, loses all traction. Allison dives to the inside, followed by Earnhardt. But Gant, obviously his tires were not heated and found himself skating in the marbles. He drops back to fourth place. Bill Elliott rides fifth. Herschel McGriff still in the action of the 04 car, along with Kyle Petty in car seven. Ricky Rudd now through the S's, moves smoothly towards turn six. Running in third gear right now, still in third. He'll drop it into second just as he comes to the crest of the hill, right here, drops it into second gear. The car gears down, dives over to the inside of the track. Wasn't a very good line that time for Ricky Rudd. No, the rear tires are obviously not up to speed yet oversteered but he had it under control but uh, definitely the track surface is getting very treacherous very slick the little rocks are pulling up out of the asphalt is what i understand bill and it's causing a lot of marbles and we've had 27 laps under the yellow for track conditions and also crashes this is going to be a relatively slow race for these winston cup grand national competitors coming back down the back straightaway we see ricky rudd looking very smart. Harry Gant's gone. But Bobby Allison is right there, and Allison will be knocking on the door when they come onto the front straightaway because he's going to close the margin down. A shuffle in positions. Harry Gant is now being hounded by Bill Elliott. Herschel McGriff wants some of the action. Those four cars run almost together. But look at Allison whittling down the lead of Ricky Rudd as they come across the stripe and head to turn one. Now Earnhardt is there, but Gant is down the pit lane. Gant has gone into the pits. Obviously some problems, maybe a tire equalized. He couldn't get into the pits last time around because of all the traffic, but this time he's in the pits on the 33 car. Travis Carter is there. They're working feverishly. Two other cars make it back into the pits. Neil Bonnet along with Jeff Bodai. A quick pit stop for the 33 runner, Harry Gant. He's back down the pit lane, but certainly he's dropped out of the contention at the present time. Sir, Another one reporting down the pit lane is a 71 car of Dave Marcus, and Marcus has a tire down on the left front, possibly running over some debris on the track. Yes, I think that the asphalt that is breaking up could be a factor here now, and Harry may have had a low tire because the car would not stay in the groove. As he went into turn nine, you could see the car come out of the groove, go toward the wall, and only his super skill kept him from crashing down there. So he de definitely had something wrong with the tires. And we can see now that the old pro, Bobby Allison, who's been pacing himself throughout this entire afternoon, is now relentlessly running down the young Ricky Rudd. 
Well, he certainly has been turning up the wick on that car. He's feverishly going around this track with every turn of the wheel. He seems to be picking up some speed and gaining some ground, but Rudd has not changed his line around the track. But Allison seems to be effortlessly catching up. His car handling just fine after being prepped by Gary Nelson, a California native. Earnhardt and Elliott have got their race among the two Fords. Kyle Petty looks strong in car number seven, and Petty is there on the lead lap, actually racing with Herschel McGriff. And I noticed some smoke that was coming from Tim Richmond's car, so we'll see if that is just a little tire rub or if, in fact, it is some terminal uh, problem. Well, Summer McKnight's coming into the pits in the 83 car. Sumner, of course, out of Eastern Maryland, resides out here in California on a part-time basis. Takes the back entrance into the pit area, and Bobby Allison's going to dive down to the inside of Ricky Rudd, try to close the distance down as they come onto that long back straightaway. And this may be Allison's lap to overtake the Piedmont pacemaker. Down the long back straightaway, they come into view before they come under the bridge. But Rudd seems to have a little advantage along that long back straightaway. He seems to be able to floor the car and make it come up to speed much quicker. He jumps off that corner a little quicker. Now Allison starts to whittle down the mar margin, and in doing so, it'll be a late braking move here in turn nine that will draw him down even closer to the leader as he drops the right front tire off into the dirt of the track. Bobby very much would like to jump into the lead and pick up those five points because that will protect his lead. So he is now close enough that on that back shoot at 170 miles an hour, he will get a draft. He can back out of the throttle ever so slightly, save the engine, it runs cooler, it conserves fuel. Bobby's in a perfect position right now. It looks to me like he's ready to move in and get those five points. Well, he's getting very, very close right now, and he is almost there as he continues to shadow down on the number three car. For Rudd, he's had that Chevrolet out front as much as he possibly could all day long and certainly has taken advantage of every opportunity to be the leader. But he almost miscued in turn six there. I imagine he's looking in the rearview mirror and seeing Bobby Allison fill it up. He's got to say, man, I've got to stay out in front. I'm running real good. This is not a super speedway. The draft will really not pay as much of effect uh, on a slingshot on the last lap. He draws away once again as he jumps on to the back straightaway coming off of turn eight. Pat Patterson is standing by in the pits. I'm talking with Warner Hodgson, the sponsor on the Neil Bonnet car. Warner, how's the car running today here at Riverside? Well, the car's been running real well, except, you know, we had a little problem up there in about the ten, first 10 laps. Got knocked off the track and got about three laps behind. Okay, can Neil come back some this afternoon? Pick up Alice. We can't, it's pretty hard to make up three laps in the Riverside track, but we're gonna, we'll run to the end. And we feel we're running in 10th place right now. And of course, we're running third points, so it's very important for us to end and finish the race. Warner, let me ask you. You sponsor a car, and you're down here with the car all the time. How do you feel about the relationship with the R.J. Reynolds Winston Tobacco Company? Well, NASCAR really started this circuit, and I feel that the Winston Company and the R.J. Reynolds Company has really made what Winston Cup racing is and Grand National Racing is today. Without their wide sponsorship, we just wouldn't have the opportunity. Somebody with Warner right now is Greg Novak with the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. Greg, are you enjoying the afternoon here at Riverside? I sure am. It's a, it's a beautiful day for racing. And um, as Warner said, we've been sponsoring Winston Cup Racing now for 13 years. And uh, we feel that we've been able to offer a lot to the sport. Um, as a matter of fact, in 1983, we have just raised our total uh, point fund winnings to a half a million dollars, which is $100,000 over what we put into the sport last year. Also, the first place finisher this year for Winston Cup Racing will receive $150,000, which is double the amount that we paid last year. That's, that's fantastic. Bobby Allison was making a charge to try to work on Ricky Rudd's first place position. All of a sudden slowed down, coming down the back straightaway. Instead of continuing on the racing surface like he normally would through turn nine, he elected to take a 30 second penalty coming through the back pits here at Riverside. He turned down around, he came down the pit lane. The hood is up on the 22 car right now. Obviously, it's more than something simple. They're talking to Bobby through the window net right now. Gary Nelson, Robert Yates, concerned about this very lengthy stop, but it's dropped Bobby Allison out of contention. Ricky Rudd continues to be the leader. We'll be back with more racing from Riverside International Raceway right after this. Ricky Rudd being scored as the leader here at Riverside International Raceway. The second place runner, Bill Elliott in car nine. Third place being shown as Dale Earnhardt. So we have a Chevrolet and two Fords running in second and third. 
The fourth place runner is car seven, Kyle Petty, having an excellent run here this afternoon. Fifth place is Morgan Shepard. He's advanced into the top five. And look at Darrell Waltrip. He's running in sixth place. And Herschel McGriff decides to bring it in through the back entrance to the pits here at Riverside International Raceway. He had a fine run going for him. He ran in the top 10 all afternoon, suffered some type of damage on the rear deck of the car, ran a few more laps, and has now decided to bring it down and back into the pit area. We have completed 72 laps here, and the competition seems to be waning here in the latter stages of this, of, of this race. There's a 10.91 second separation between first and second place. First place belonging to Ricky, Ricky Rudd, the Chesapeake, Virginia native. Second place belonging to Bill Elliott, with Dale Earnhardt running in third place. Ironic, Ricky Rudd was second in this race last year. Now, Ricky Rudd is very good on the road courses. Uh, he's had enough experience uh, with the short tracks that it really pays off. Ricky's young, he doesn't tire here, and, and this is a little bit more fatiguing maybe than, than say, a long track where you can get on the straightaway and stretch and, and relax. Here you've got the left and right turns. Most of the drivers aren't used to the G-loads that you get in turning to the right instead of always turning to the left. So uh, this definitely is a track that Ricky has done well on, and today he's showing. He's stretching his lead just about a half a second a lap now over Bill Elliott. And he's using his traffic, he's making an excellent pass right now, staying out of trouble, and maintaining that good lead over Bill Elliott. Well, right now, with the lead that he has over Bill Elliott, he's maintaining a, a very nice rhythm, and that's what it takes, an artistic approach to driving this track at the present time, trying to make every corner just perfect. For one thing, he doesn't have a lot of pressure on him, but he does have one thing standing in his way between now and victory, and that is that he's gonna have to make another pit stop. Uh, running in second place is Bill Elliott. Elliott's running 12.48 seconds behind your leader. The Piedmont Airlines pacemaker setting the pace at the present time. Some of the other cars still running and in contention are the Earnhardt car. Waltrip is still on the track and Waltrip is having a, a good run after some complications early in the going causing him to visit the pits on several occasions. A rundown right now shows Rudd as your leader, Bill Elliott in second place, Earnhardt runs fourth, and McGriff, until he made this pit stop, was the fourth place runner and was a fine run for the Bridal Vale, Oregon driver. Fifth place on lap 70 was showing his car number 70. We've got a car loose. It's Neil Bonnet. Bonnet apparently is exploding an engine, cocks it sideways, gets it out of harm's way. It was a tire. The left front tire on the Warner Hodgson entry, car 75, the Chevrolet Monte Carlo, and Neil Bonnet just cut down, coming through turn nine, possibly picking up some debris. He's sitting there waiting for the engine to refire. They had some problems early on. He's been running very well. He did a matchful job keeping it, one, off the outside wall, and two, getting it slowed down before the concrete abutment. Had he hit that abutment, it could have been, obviously, a serious incident. Well, he almost collected up uh, several other drivers who managed to get by on either side of him. Now the crew is running down to him, and NASCAR says, fellas, you've got to stay away from the car. There is danger with people coming down the pit lane. I believe that the, once the car gets into the white line, the pit area, I believe the rule is that then they can assist the car. Well, J.D. McDuffie looked like he was going to make a turn down the pit lane and decided to continue down the front straightaway. The yellow flag is being shown so they can retrieve Neil Bonnet from the edge of the racing surface. Meanwhile, Ricky Rudd has a chance to relax a little bit, but it's also going to tighten up the field. We'll be back from Riverside International Raceway at the Budweiser 400 in just a few moments. For Ricky Rudd, it's now on the line. As we move into the closing stages of this race, they posted that 79 laps have been completed. 16 laps ago, we have completed 80. That's correct, 79 laps completed, 16 to go. He moves through turn number eight, brings the car around, tries to apex that inside corner, then moves it back over to the left, apexes that corner, moves onto the straightaway. Now, he has shown some power coming down that back straightaway and has managed on occasion to move away from whoever's running behind him by anywhere from three to five car lengths. 
he's got that car hooked up because you can see him physically pull away coming out of the corner and that's what it takes on a short track that's what it takes on a road track is to brake late get through it cleanly and get the power down as early as possible and you can see that he is now pulled out about an eight car length over Bill Elliott. The charge is on. Darrell Waltrip is moved by Dale Earnhardt in the third place on that long back straightaway. It may be Ricky Rudd in the lead, but coming on strong, making that charge is car number 11. Darrell Waltrip in the Junior Johnson car. He's got his final instructions. He's made his final pit stop, and he is bringing that car on. Into turn two, he'll be working through the S's. Ricky Rudd will be shielding off the competition as he is probably hearing on the radio from his crew chief, Richard Childress, that Waltrip is on the charge. Do whatever it takes but stay out in front. And there's Waltrip. He's moving up on the rear bumper now, Bill Elliott. Bill out of Dawsonville, Georgia. Waltrip's been to victory lane here before. He knows the way there. For Ricky Rudd, it would be in a brand new experience. You can see some damage right there on the number 11 where somebody's wheel has gotten into Waltrip earlier in the day. And you can see now the key will be for Ricky is how quickly Darrell can get by. It looks like he's pulling up. If he gets in the draft, he'll get by him coming down the sweeper. And we'll see Darrell in second spot as he comes underneath the bridge. And then Ricky has his work cut out for him. Both of those cars tacking up for Elliott, pulling 7,600 RPMs for the 11 car. Waltrip, he's pulling 8,000 RPMs and pulls past the number nine car diving into turn three he is going to try to go after the leader he is making every effort they're running on clear racing surface right now there are no cars in front of them there are no traffic to bog them down they will be engaging in heated battle within laps between the first and second place cars an opportunity for ricky rudd to conquer this track it could be another triumph for darrell waltrip Hi, this is Harry again. We'll be back to Riverside Raceway in one minute. They move to turn eight. Waltrip is into the corner, following Rudd. Rudd comes onto the back straightaway. This is where he's had an advantage before with the other runners. For Waltrip, it's been a long run. We have one car off course, sitting off in the dirt, posing no threat, and hopefully the yellow flag won't come out because we're getting set for a showdown here at Riverside, California. 81 laps have been posted. There goes Ricky Rudd, and he did pick up some distance over Darrell Waltrip. 2.34 second separation between first and second place. Bill Elliott stays in the hunt. Dale Earnhardt in the hunt. He runs in fourth place, coming through turn nine now. We're showing a yellow flag. The yellow is being shown on the track. Harold Kinder has it out of the start-finish line, so Waltrip, Elliott, and Earnhardt will be able to bunch up your first four runners. The fifth-place runner should be Dick Brooks from nearby Porterville, California. And Brooks said his mom and dad were going to be here today. They're in retirement, but they were coming over here to see their son run on home turf. He's originally from Porterville. Of course, he made the trek out east back in 1969 to take a Plymouth out there, run down at Daytona, and of course, that's how he got involved in Grand National Racing at the time. Uh, it's always nice to do well in front of your parents and your relatives and your friends. Sometimes that's when the most pressure is on, Bill. You come, you want to do well, and sometimes that's when things don't go very well. So he's had a great run, fifth place here. Uh, and the Fords now, look where the Fords are. They're now second, uh, third, and fifth. So it's been a good day for Fords. Well, with the top five drivers bunched up, we'll take this opportunity to pause for this message from the Budweiser 400 at Riverside International Raceway. We'll be back in a minute. I'm with Richard Childers, crew chief on the Piedmont Airlines Ricky Rudd car. Ricky Rudd looking for his first Grand National victory. We have nine laps to go as we come by. What have you got to tell Ricky right now to get him into victory lane? Well, it ain't a whole lot, of, you know, we can do. We just told him, you know, do everything he can. We ain't got quite as good of tires as we had the time before, but he'll give it his best shot like all of us have. You've obviously been keeping times all afternoon. How close are you and Walter running in proportion to speed? Darrell's right now just a shade faster, but, you know, hope, you know, if we can run long enough, his tires may give up a little and ours get better. Okay, you excited for him? Yeah. Obviously. Okay, 
Richard Childers getting ready. Nine laps to go here at Riverside, and it's going to be a shootout right to the end. Well, Jim Bow, the gentleman that brought out the yellow flag, looking for a good day here today, started up towards the front of the pack. The best qualifying Winston West driver has been pushed back into his pit area after stalling on the course and bringing out the yellow flag. The well, pace car has the field under tow. Ricky Rudd is lined up in the first position. Darrell Waltrip runs second. Then Bill Elliott. Then Dale Earnhardt. Dick Brooks. Morgan Shepard. Kyle Petty. Harry Gant. And the top eight drivers are running in the lead lap. We're set for a shootout here at Riverside, California. You know, Ricky's been tested all day by everybody, but now behind him is the reigning Winston Cup champion for the last two years. This will really be a test, and Ricky's withstood the test all day. But I'll tell you, everyone says this is a shootout, and really, this is going to be a great show with eight cars, and anything can happen on a road course. The car in fourth could be first, and that's what makes us so excited. Well, this is very similar to the International Race of Champions, certainly the finest in NASCAR, and some young chargers have the opportunity to score a victory here in Southern California and carry a, a memory with them back to the East Coast. And I tell you what, it's going to be a real challenge among these drivers. We'll be back with more racing from Riverside International Raceway right after this. Racing on the Grand Prix circuit is living life on the edge. Silverstone, England is the next stop for Formula One cars and their fearless drivers. Auto Racing 83 presents the British Grand Prix, Wednesday on your total sports network, ESPN. Auto Racing 83 puts you on the right track with off-road racing. It's motorized mayhem from Pomona, here Monday on ESPN. You've got one guy that's been the victory lane up there on numerous occasions. Here, he's the reigning Winston Cup champion sitting in second place. Darrell Waltrip, and of course, he's receiving instructions from Junior Johnson down on the pits. And then you've got a driver that's never been to victory lane, Ricky Rudd, running in the first position. And Richard Childress is sitting down on the pits with two-way radio in contact with his driver to tell him, keep it up front. You've got Bill Elliott, who's been the bridesmaid six times. He's touring the track in third place. And of course, he's got Ernie Elliott on the radio to him. Dick Brooks is there, home turf for him in car number 90. He would like nothing better than to win with Junie Don Levy. And then, of course, there's Dale Earnhardt. As they come around into turn eight, the green flag should be coming out. And they are racing again. They overtake the pace car, which tries to maintain speed to make its exit from the track. And Ricky Rudd charges under the bridge. He'll be coming through right now. And he has got it on the floorboard. He flat has car number three. The Piedmont pacemaker wound up. He's doing everything but leaving the ground right now as he is in front of Darrell Walter through turn nine. Look out, Morgan Shepard in the wall. Shepard skids around, locks it up in turn nine. But your leaders are coming to the stripe. The green flag continues to wave. Morgan is out of harm's way. I don't believe he hit the wall, so I think we'll be able to go without a yellow. He's got it going now. He's back on the track. I believe we'll run under the green all the rest of the way home now. Well, he is clear of traffic right now as your leaders go through the S's here at Riverside International Raceway. Pitching the car sideways, Ricky Rudd fighting the challenge of Darrell Waltrip. But Darrell Waltrip has his prey right in front of his automobile as he skates the car a little sideways, losing some adhesion. Ricky Rudd needs the stick. He needs to throw the tires to work. He works through turn eight now. He's been able to draw away along this back straightaway, which has been to his advantage. He's got plenty of torque and plenty of horsepower. Look at the advantage that he draws away over Darrell Waltrip as they go down the back straightaway. He wants to thwart the advance of the 11 car. Waltrip appears to drop back just a hair. The separation is a little larger than it was the last time they came through under the bridge and into nine. Bill Elliott has turned up the wick, and we have a battle for fourth place as Dick Brooks takes over that position in car number 90, the Junie Dunleavy car. Earnhardt's going to try to take him back low on the inside, drops a wheel over in the dirt. As those two drivers are battling for position, he washes out as he goes high on the track. Ricky Rudd is back to the stripe. Darrell Walter runs behind him, eight car lengths. 
Then Bill Elliott rides in fourth place, rather third place, the fourth place driver, Dick Brooks, and fifth place, Dale Earnhardt. Sixth place, Harry Gant. That's the way they're lined up here. As we complete another lap of competition, Ricky Rudd truly S's. And Ricky has been quite crafty in his maneuvers around the track, and he has not put the car in any position to really jeopardize it all afternoon. He's running very smoothly. He's got that rhythm that you talked about, Bill. He's got that rhythm dialed. Daryl's going to have to break out of his rhythm. He's going to have to turn the wick up because Ricky has really got it dialed. And so one of the things that's going to be critical now is on the back straightaway coming down into nine, which is where we're probably going to see this race won and lost. And it appears to be very slippery. We've seen a number of cars down here get in and get out of the groove because it's very slippery. So we'll keep an eye on that as, as it gets near the end. Hi, this is Tim Richmond. We'll be right back here to the Riverside Raceway right after this. A minute, rather 1.31 second separation. 1.31 second separation between first and second place. And Waltrip runs a little higher and gets a little loose through turn nine. That's well, where it's getting slippery down there, Bill. Everyone seems to be getting up high now. Look at this battle for fourth place among three drivers. Gant. Earnhardt and Brooks. Brooks maintains the line, tightens it up going into turn one, but Earnhardt dives by on the inside and Gant may be going by on the outside. You see Richard Petty running slow off the pace up through turn six. He hasn't had a very good day all afternoon, but there goes the Piedmont pacemaker. A little slippery that time through turn six. He'll be drawing up on Richard Petty at any moment now. He's up to turn eight. This has been a very good corner for Ricky all day long. He's got it dialed in, and the car is handling superbly through that portion of the track. He's now down the back straightaway. Look at the car come up to speed with a burst of power. There goes Richard Petty by. Looks like he's able to maintain his advantage over the second place runner. Down in the nine. He's looked good all day. He's been racing the track amazingly. And has not really bothered to race any other competitor out here. But look at Waltrip. He goes higher each time he goes through nine. That means that car's not quite handling like it was in the earlier going. But Ricky Rudd's car's like it's on rails. Handling this track as if he were a downhill racer. Every move coordinated. Artistic ability. Third place battle. Look at Earnhardt. Look at Harry Gant. Gant's down to the inside. Walter cuts him off. Rather, Earnhardt cuts him off. Runs over the speed bumps. We call that slamming the door. He slammed the door on him that time, that's for sure. But look at Gant. He is riding on the ragged edge through the S's. Leader coming up to turn eight again the car and smoothly brings the car around that portion of the track. He's doing everything right so far, and it may just pay off for Richard Childress and Ricky Rudd. Here goes Dave Marcus by, along with Sterling Marlin and Richard Petty, down that long back straightaway. Now traffic is going to become a, a factor because you can see that Ricky's starting to come on a little slower cars. And he can either use this to his disadvantage or it could be a detriment. Let's see how he handles it. Fortunately, he got by Sterling Marlin going into the corner. He's going to work traffic perfectly if he possibly can. He's not going to try to run up on Dave Marcus and Richard Petty going through a corner. He wants to get them on a straightaway. That way, he doesn't have to break his rhythm. Let's see if he's able smoke to... Smoke out from under the 17 car. Sterling Marlin showing smoke. Now, right behind him is Darrell Waltrip. He smartly moves the car to the right-hand side of the racetrack, allowing Waltrip by. And Elliott will get by. For Ricky Rudd, he's coming through the S's. He has overtaken Dave Marcus. He'll be overtaking Petty now, but he does have traffic between himself and the second-place runner. Coming to the top of the hill now. Turn six, he smartly stays in position to pass Petty when they come onto the straightaway. That's a very smart move on the part of Ricky Rudd. Ricky told me several days ago, he said, Bill, he said, I like to race road courses, and it's a lot of fun. I hope I can be around at the finish. 
because you have to be there when they throw that white flag to be in contention to win a race no matter whether it's on a super speedway or here on this remarkable road course where the legends have been born like Dan Gurney, Phil Hill, Richie Genther in road racing and of course Petty and Waltrip, the current runners in NASCAR activity. Well, Rudd draws up on Richard Petty and he's been pacing himself now. Richard is right in front of him. He comes around, Richard down low to the inside. Let's see what Richard does when Ricky Rudd moves up, holds to the outside line. Rudd trying to overtake him and Richard is uh, apparently racing with him. Now he drops back and fades in behind him going into turn one. Walter will have to overtake Petty along with Bill Elliott. Fourth place runner now, Harry Gant. There's some speculation that Walter might be having a problem. He might have a soft tire. We've got a report in from the corner saying that it looked like one tire was a little bit soft and that could be why he made that charge and he's dropping back. Let's see if he can maintain that second position. We're showing 91 laps complete. We're into the final four laps here at Riverside, California. The sunny southern skies of this area near Hollywood, California. And what a drama we have. A young driver looking for that first opportunity to go into victory lane. And it may come here on a road course foreign to this young driver who's an accomplished super speedway racer. But here at Riverside, the opportunity to etch his name in the record book is going to be coming up. And it is a shootout, but he's driving a remarkable race at the present time. He moves up on slow traffic again. Glenn Francis in front of him. He moves over to the inside of Francis, and Richard is back up to speed now, even though he's several laps down. You know, Richard did a nice thing here on the front straightaway last lap. The fast line as you come out of turn nine is a swing over to the right-hand side, so he gave him that. Now we have a switch. We did notice that the tire was going low, and now Bill Elliott has overtaken Darrell Waltrip. And with just four laps to go, it, we'll see now if Daryl can hold off Harry Gant. And Harry Gant, of course, smells, smells the blood, as they say, and he's going to be chasing him down. Well, the car's not running at full song now for Daryl Waltrip. It doesn't sound like it's up to par. It sounds like he's got some problems, perhaps in the engine compartment, but he has been slowing down here in the last half a lap. For Ricky Rudd, he's looking in his rearview mirror and perhaps breathing a sigh of relief right now, but at the same time, those strange things could be running through his head about, I hope I can make it. You start hearing all kinds of weird sounds about right now. You start listening for things, not for sounds that you've never heard before. Even though they've been there the whole race, it's a, it's a very tense moment for a driver. In the last five laps of this competition in previous years, strange things have happened. Blown tires, debris on the track, broken parts. There's Elliott. Elliott heads down that long back straightaway now. He's in hot pursuit of the front running car, Ricky Rudd. But Ricky has an advantage. Ricky takes it into turn number nine. Ricky has looked very good all day. He has performed flawlessly. He has been able to evade his finest competition here in the closing laps. The only pressure he has felt was that from Darrell Waltrip. Waltrip has fallen further back. You can see how high he gets in turn nine. It's, it has to be some one of the tires, either a bad tire or a tire has lost its pressure. Well, the distance is between turn one and turn two with two laps to go. Ricky Rudd, the Piedmont Airline car, he's moving it through the aces, rather the S's right now. Comes into turn number six. Goes into the corner. Handles through that corner perfectly. He'll be coming around to take the white flag on this lap. Rudd through turn eight. They're coming onto the back straightaway. He really has no one applying any pressure at the present time. He can drive his own race. As he overtakes a slower car, moves towards the bridge here at Riverside International Raceway. Or Ricky Rudd, I imagine his heart right now is in his throat. He's feeling ecstatic about all this. I imagine that Richard Childress is just telling him, calm down, be careful, bring it around one more time. You've done a fine job at this point. Don't gamble, just take keep, it easy. Just keep it on the table for one minute and 25 seconds and your first victory on a road course. Here he comes. He's a little loose through nine though as he moves up on the back 
of Jimmy Means. The white flag's out. He's starting to take it easy now. He's breaking his rhythm just a little bit. The move by Jimmy Means. He's down into turn one. Everybody else is still strung out. There may be a battle between Carter and Ine, Dick Brooks, and Kyle Petty in seven as they battle for a top five position. Ricky Rudd, he's through the S's right now. He doesn't appear to be running as quick as he was on the previous laps. He's being quite careful. He's not going to hang the car out there. He's not going to jeopardize anything. For Ricky Rudd can see the dollar signs now. He can smell victory. It's eluded him since he started racing in 1975. He won a race earlier this year at Dover Downs, Delaware, a late model sportsman race as a preliminary to the Mason-Dixon 500. He's down the back straightaway. What a feeling he must have right now. I imagine there's probably a tear running down his cheek because it's taken a long time for the son of Al Rudd to reach victory lane. A beautiful shot now as he comes through the dog leg he heads for turn number nine. He looks sharp. The Monte Carlo SS, the Piedmont pacemaker, the pride of Chesapeake, Virginia, is on his way. You have to have feelings and emotion for a young driver like this who has persevered and persevered. And he's around for the finish. Harold Kinder waves a checkered flag. He has his hand out of the window for Ricky Rudd. It's his first victory ever coming here at Riverside, California. Second place goes to Bill Elliott. Third place, car number 33, Harry Gant. Fourth will go to Earnhardt. Fifth place, looks like Dick Brooks. His crew, ecstatic. They're happy, they're overjoyed. What an opportunity and what an emotional moment. For this driver, coming into victory lane here. They can't hardly believe it, but their driver has brought it home the winner of the 1983 Budweiser 400. He was rookie of the year in 1977. He had finished second five times up till today. Currently riding 11th in points. He was second in this race last year. And the amazing thing about it, he went over the $1 million mark in earnings with this race. Finishing in first place, Ricky Rudd. And there's his crew. They're all being congratulated by, of course, all the folks around. This is when it turns into family for these crews along pit lane for the opportunity to go over and congratulate a driver who's never been to victory lane before. Richard Childress, Kirk Shelmerdine, feeling good. Now the congratulation coming from Bill Elliott in Carter and I. Elliott pulls up and Elliott, can you believe it, has finished second again. Seven times. From the Budweiser 400 in sunny Southern California, we'll be returning in just a few moments with Victory Lane and a very happy Ricky Rudd. Slowly, he comes down Victory Lane. It's over. It's a moment to relax. He made it. He made it into Victory Lane. He's quite happy. His wife, Linda, there. She's happy about it. And Ricky is trying to find his way into victory lane right now. It's a road that you only need to learn one time, but then you know how to go there time and time again. NASCAR officials say, turn this way and head up that ramp for the accolades of victory, the spoils of the war. Certainly no agony for Ricky Rudd. It's all ecstasy here this afternoon at Riverside, California. Scoreboard says that Bill Elliott finished in second place in car number nine. First time uh, he's finished that high here at Riverside, California. And for 33, Harry Gant, a third place honor going his way. And certainly it's going to shuffle around the Grand National point standings. As we see, three drivers do very well here this afternoon at Riverside, California. It was a tight race because of the caution flags that we saw throughout the afternoon that kept the field tight. We had a lot of drivers running in the lead lap in the closing stages of this race. But the pride of Chesapeake, Virginia, Ricky Rudd, takes the honors this afternoon here at Riverside, California. Richard Childers, this has got to be the happiest day in racing that you have ever had. How do you, your feelings right now? Well, I'm just thrilled for the whole crew and Ricky and 
everyone behind us. They've, you know, Piedmont Airlines has stuck with us, you know, when we had bad times, and they're a great sponsor, and A&W tru Trucking is a co-sponsor, and they've been with us. And it's, uh, we got a winning team. We just had a lot of bad luck, and we had a lot of people to work hard and put it together. Kirk Shammerdine, the crew chief, he's super. Uh, will this turn it around for you to feel like, Richard? Well, we hope so. You know, it, racing's tough, and, it, you know, you can't count on nothing in it from race, you know, from race to race. You just got to go out and race every race individual and do as hard as you can. Okay, Richard Childers got to be the happiest crew chief here in Riverside, California. For anyone who's followed the career of Ricky Rudd, it's been a long time coming. He's been second, but he had never won a Winston Cup race, and it had to come so far from home. Well, Bill, you kind of make that sound like a eulogy or something, but <laughs> now we're just tickled to death with it. Like you say, it's been, we've been waiting a long time for this and just really tickled to death that it's come. It's just really hadn't sunk in. It's hard to believe that this uh, Piedmont Airlines A&W Truck and Company car held together all day long. It was the strongest car on the racetrack. The guys back home did a good job on the motors, and we had the car that was the one to beat out there today, but we were just worried about finishing. We broke down the last three or four races. Well, the car certainly handled flawlessly for you. It looked like you were taking it easy the final lap or so once you noticed that Darrell Waltrip started dropping back. Well, uh, really, it was only a few times that I ran the car really hard. And, uh, we were really worried about maybe blistering tires. We were pulling a lot of heat on our tire temperatures, and we were worried that we might abuse a tire if we ran it really hard. And uh, after one set of tires, uh, they looked good the last time they pulled them off. I went ahead and ran the car hard for about 10 or 15 laps, trying to keep Darrell behind me. It was looking, shaping up to be a good race. I could see it starting to open daylight in between me and him. Then all of a sudden, I guess he had some kind of trouble, and I just kind of paced around the last couple laps to finish it. Well, Linda, how do you feel about Ricky finally making it home first? It's fine with me. We can do it a lot more times. Well, I know you're looking forward to visiting Victory Lane again. Riverside, California, home of the Budweiser 400, and this one was for you, Ricky. Well, thank you. Thank the Budweiser crew for the whole Budweiser people for putting this race on. Our congratulations to Ricky Rudd and his victory here in the Budweiser 400 at Riverside, California. Well, I guess that concludes our day here at Riverside, California, Lauren. Well, you know, Bill, I, we talked all day about Ricky, and he was challenged by the old pros, by, by Bobby Allison, and by the current champion, Darrell Waltrip. And Ricky had the rhythm. We talked about it. Uh, he had the car working. Uh, he seemed to be able to do it, and everyone came up and challenged him. But Ricky had it. It was his day, and we're just very proud. He's going to be a great Budweiser winner here today. Riverside, California, the Budweiser 400. For Lawrence St. Lawrence and Pat Patterson, I'm Bill Hennessy.